There we are, day number 19 already of the 1605 Content Festival. Welcome, my name is Jente Kater from Voice Booking. 1605, it's a new festival. While we were all in lockdown, we thought, let's do something inspiring. And here we are with 21 webinars in a row. Before we start, I'm founder of Voice Booking. I'm a voice actor myself. I stutter every now and then. So if you hear me stutter, that's... That, that's just me, yeah. Um, today's webinar is going to be about audiobooks. Let me tell you a secret. When I started with doing voiceovers, I had been in radio for over 15 years. And I always thought, well, voiceovering, voiceovering like a pro, that's, that's something magical. And that's not something I have the talent for. But somehow I got involved with it and uh, I got to be the station voice of a big station here in the Netherlands. And like many radio DJs, I put it way too much emphasis on words and on the wrong words. Hmm. I needed to learn some skills. Then one day I got to read my first bedtime story for my oldest daughter. She's 14 now. And after doing it, I thought that was fun, but it could be better. So every evening while I was reading books out loud for my kids, I crafted and I crafted and I learned and I learned. And after a few years, I got my daughters hanging on to every word I was saying. Tell me more, Dad. Oh, please don't stop. Go on, go on. That was quite some fun. And it made me better as being a voiceover. So reading books out loud, it's not only fun, but for voiceovers and especially the ones just starting, it's learning by doing. It's it's, it's fun and it's learning by doing. That's great. But today we're going to take it a step further. In today's webinar, you will get the tips and tips and tricks you will need to, to do voiceover for audiobooks professionally. And therefore, we ask a truly talented audiobook narrator, Nano Nagel. She's from the UK, lives in London, and uh, she will start in a few moments. During the session, if you have any questions, just ask them via the Zoom question and answer or via the comment section within Facebook. And afterwards, I will interview Nano and uh, um, I will uh, do your questions. So, day number 19 of the 1605 Content Festival, it's webinar number 19. Here's Nano Nagel with how to narrate audiobooks. Enjoy. Hello. The Three Little Wolves and the Big Bad Pig. Once upon a time, there were three cuddly little wolves with soft fur and fluffy tails who lived with their mother. The first was black, the second was gray, and the third was white. One day, the mother called the three little wolves around her and said, my children, it is time for you to go out into the world. Go and build a house for yourselves. But beware of the big bad pig. Here we are doing audiobooks, which I do every day, all the time in my booth. And I've come to talk to you about how to be really excellent at narrating audiobooks. The first thing you have to do, and I think when we were listening to Yenta saying how he got better narrating to his children, I think that's a great way to start. I really love doing children's books. I do a lot of them. And children are the best critics. They really are. Just as his children said, do it again, do it again. Often children will say, that's rubbish. You weren't really the character. They can tell whether you are real or not. And that is something that you have to remember when you are narrating an audiobook. Your audience, your listeners have to believe in you. They have to know that you mean it and that you're really telling them a true story. It's fiction, of course, but they have to feel that they're part of it. Now, I'm going to start from the very beginning here. Firstly, you have to have a brilliant studio. You have to have a studio which records you so that your naked voice sounds good, all your characters will come alive, and you will be able to tell stories that will be capable of getting into somebody's little ear and living there. 
So that's a, as read. You have to have a good studio. I can't tell you how to do that because I'm not a technical genius, but there are some brilliant technical geniuses. The first thing you have to do, though, is you get a book and you're so excited. So you get this book and you say, hmm, what do I do? I'll just put it in front of my mic and I will just read the book because that's what I do in real life. But actually, no, that's the worst thing to do. What you have to do is read that book. First, I skim read the book. So I know what it's about a bit, you know, but not really d deep down. And then I look at it and I look at the characters. I read it. I annotate it. I highlight all the different characters. Usually I have books with a lot of characters. So I highlighted all those different characters in different colors. If it's a translation, so therefore it has strange, well, it has foreign words in it. Of course, they're going to be anglicized in a way, and the people listening to that will understand that. After all, if you actually have the word Paris in a book and it's in France, you don't say Paris unless you are actually speaking in French. You say Paris because it's anglicized. So you do that with most of the words like that. But if I'm doing a detective novel at the moment set in Sweden, and they are running all over Stockholm, and I have to say these words and street names so that they are really understood in Swedish. So you have to do that type of thing, and you have to research what you're doing. Maybe look at a map of Sweden and see where they were going and what they're doing and the type of houses that they'd be going into, balconies or whatever. It's really important that you know where you are. So that's the setting. Now, characters. Often people say that they're going to give characters like film character. You know, you think of somebody in a film and say, oh, yeah, I'm going to make him like Jude Law or something. Well, actually, I don't do that. I look at how the author has written the character. I see it. I feel it. And strangely, because I started life out as an actress, it just pops into my head how they feel and they are. And when I'm reading, they take on a life of their own. The most important thing, too, is how do they relate to the other characters in the book? And it's worthwhile noting how they do relate to the other characters in the book. So research, research, read your book. You have to do that in about three days, actually. You can't be spending a lot of time on it because you only have a short period of time to actually produce this book. Usually they'll give you three weeks. Sometimes they give you a month. Therefore, you can do all that prepping in a week. But your book might be 20 hours long. And 20 hours is not just 20 hours reading. It's multiplied that many times. So you've done your research. You feel you know your characters. And it's a bit like stepping on stage that first day when you say chapter one. Chapter one, and you have that strange hiatus, that pause, and you begin. What you have to realize is that you're going to be narrating this book for, for example, about 35 hours if it's a 20 hour book. If it's a 10 hour book, you can probably be do that in about 15, 16 hours if you're really, really good. Because and, and it takes a while to be good. I'm not putting you off, but you do have to practice a lot. You can go into a cupboard. Actually, a lot of American narrators say, go into a cupboard, get the book, and read the book by yourself in a cupboard. See how you go. And you, of course, make mistakes. That is the problem. <laughs> you always make mistakes with things like that. Now, that is a difficult situation you're in when you're doing a read and you make mistakes. When you're actually reading and you've got your microphone, you've got your words there, and you're really getting into it, you've got to be directing yourself. So you don't have somebody else behind the other side of the glass. You are directing yourself, much like an actor is in fact technically thinking, oh, I need to go to start down stage right, and I need to pick up the glasses now as I say this. You have to be becoming another character, narrating, 
going into the end of chapter one, where perhaps something happens and you need to alert your audience that something incredible is going to happen. You are directing yourself all the time. So you are aware that you've got another self looking at the technical things that you're doing. That's really important. And in fact, what you do is as you're reading one line and you're very much into it, you have a cast of characters and you need to work out how they fit together. You are, in fact, reading the lines that come after that. So you're always aware what you're going to do, whether you have to, oh, there's an amazing piece of technical equipment called an app called I Annotate. And that means that you never have to turn a sheet. You don't have to worry about paper or anything like that. You're just on the iPad and you just flick it up and you go so smoothly that you could, in fact, if you are really amazing, and there are some narrators who are really amazing, who don't make any mistakes at all, and they can go for a whole hour with no mistakes. Well, Sorry to say, I am a human and I can't do that. I can go for about half an hour, 45 minutes, and make no mistakes when everything is flowing really well. But you make a mistake. And it's strange when you make a mistake because you realize as you're going on, you think, oh my God, two lines before I actually said as instead of it. So you have to stop and you go back and you're going to punch and roll your mistake. You're going to get rid of it. Punch and roll or rock and roll, as they say in Britain. Punch and roll, they say in America. I don't know what they say in continental Europe because they must have words for that. But what happens is that you go back to your mistake and you find a good place to begin again. Usually it's the beginning of a sentence or it might be the beginning of a paragraph. It's very, very quick reading. And you put your cursor there and you punch and what happens is that it rolls back two seconds so that you can hear what happened before and you can adjust your voice so it's absolutely exact and you can continue the story and you can get rid of your mistake so now all producers want you to record punch and rolling so that you get rid of all your mistakes so you go on you keep recording we keep recording and you have to put things in files. You can't just record, record, record. Every chapter has to go into a file and has to be titled. So you have to have it numerically organized so that you start with the prologue and you go to your epilogue. So that's 001 to 0021 or 31, whatever. But file systems are incredibly important because producers are making thousands of audio books a week and the sound engineers need to see your package and see that it is all absolutely perfect otherwise they'll send it back to you and you'll you, you'll lose the money really so you've got your files right you've got everything and you then send it to the sound engineer the sound engineer is usually a proofer as well as a sound engineer so they're going to compress it and make it compatible with all the digital platforms that they have nowadays which there are quite a lot this is when you have to wait you might be starting another audiobook so you're doing your prep maybe you're looking after that and then you will get back from the proofer all the mistakes that you didn't pick up because no matter how good you are there will be pickups sometimes you put a pause in for non some unknown reason there might be a noise in the background might have been your clothing but you may have said a word the wrong way or you may have said the wrong word so what you have to do is pick up all those mistakes the most mistakes i've ever had when i was really really beginning was about 200 but it was a 23 hour book and actually that's not really many when you think about it so when you send up those pickups they ask you to put it on one file because obviously the sound engineer is sitting there and what he or she wants to do is just pop them in where they are you know and they've got the minutes and seconds they've got the indicators where they are now you could, as an audiobook narrator, you could just sit in your booth and you could just do the pickups without referring to your 
book that you'd already narrated. But I never do that. I think the best thing to do is go back to the files you've got, re record it in situ so that you actually listen to it and then punch and roll and then put the words or the phrases that they want and then it seamlessly fits in and then you copy and paste it onto another file and they're all numbered so they'll be able to do it easier and actually the the sound engineers thank you for that because you sound exactly the same you've been able to have the character's voice you've been able to have your narrator's voice or whatever and you put it straight in pop it in it's perfect um so you've done that and that's the book that you've finished you've sent it to them and they zhuzh it up and then it goes on to audible with a beautiful little uh, cover <laughs> it's fantastic and um i have to say that when i look back at all the books that i've done i've done about 75 now and so that's a lot but it's not it's i think it's an enormous amount but i have done coaching with audiobook narrators who've done 800 to one and a half thousand books so you get much better as you go on. Now I think, oh, this is going to take me two weeks and it only takes me a week. But you have to love books. All I'm saying is about audiobooks. It's not like any other voiceover. It is completely different. You either love it or hate it because you spend a lot of time in your booth and sometimes in this hot weather. That is a very, very difficult thing to be doing. And let me tell you. And you have got to go to a different world. You really do have to go to a different world. And you spend a lot of time on the one job and you're, you're tired afterwards. It's not like doing any other type of voiceover. So let us go back to a little bit of audiobook narration. Don't worry, mother, said the little wolves. We will watch out for the big bad pig. Soon. They met a kangaroo who was pushing a wheelbarrow full of red and yellow bricks. Please, will you give us some of your bricks? asked the three little wolves. Certainly, said the kangaroo, and she gave them lots of red and yellow bricks. So, the three little wolves built themselves a house of bricks. The very next day, the big bad pig came prowling down the road and saw the house of bricks that the little wolves had built. And what is going to happen next? Yenta. What is going to happen next? It's so beautiful to see you talking and, and um, uh, I see, I see what you're, uh, I see you're, you're talking with your whole, whole, whole book body which is really beautiful <laughs> it's inspiring words thank you very much Nena. um how did you start did you well, well i was an actress you know i worked as an actress all my life mm -hmm. and i worked a lot in children's theater when i first started in theater so i very much had a relationship with children and storytelling and i was a really good storyteller, you know, um, an improviser. So I could hold an audience of 500 children sitting in a circle and tell them a story. So I was always good at that. Yeah. And that's hard. Let me, I mean, even if I say so myself, I don't want to blow my own trumpet, but I really loved doing it. And I think that is the thing about whatever you do. If you love it, you somehow be able to capture an audience. And as I grew older, you have less and less parts for older women mm -hmm. in the theater. And yep. the theater is what I love because I love live audience. But I realized that I had to find something else. And storytelling, I did a lot. And suddenly I was doing a workshop at the Actors Center in London and the woman came over to me and said, do audiobooks. <laughs> and I went, hmm, okay. Okay, but I thought people who did them were so good, I just couldn't compete. Mm. Anyway, I started doing them and learning how to do them, and I just became addicted. Great, great. And what sort of books do you think are most easy to start with? It is interesting about children's books, but I think they're very hard to do because children are really critical. If you don't 
be a character that is believable, a child just thinks it's rubbish. And so you then lose heart. I know you said, I just did it until I was good. But the majority of parents go, oh, I'm hopeless at that. I, I don't want to do it. Yeah. So they give up. But, um, and a lot of people do that with audiobooks too. So I think the simplest thing to do is nonfiction. Because in nonfiction, you are telling someone how to do something. You have to take on a character because the person who wrote it, maybe they're skilled at carpentry, but you're telling someone how to set out the wood, what you have to do. And in lots of ways, it's calming. Yeah. And I've always thought that that was easy, you know, not difficult. But the thing with nonfiction is um, many times that people write in written language and and not in spoken language. Yeah. Damn. I know that you think they do, but in actual fact, if you really research it and you listen to it, you can see that there's a voice there. I recently did a thing called Junk DNA, which was incredibly hard because it was a scientist trying to talk to people and popularize her science. But she had a voice. She was saying, listen to me. It wasn't a PhD thesis. Mm -hmm. you know which i know what you're talking about but m very few people would want that on an audio you'll see that most of the non-fiction are self-help type things or they want to popularize science yeah so so you uh so you heard okay uh you had you had to do something with audiobooks and how did did you start it then right so I thought, oh my God, I can't just write to Penguin Random House and say, hey, I thought this would be a great idea for me to do because you have to be so skilled. And as we all know, if you're not skilled and you say to somebody, I can do it, you'll never work again, if you know what I mean, because you are going to fail. So I found ACX and ACX is a part of or Amazon. And what they were doing is it was when people were doing ebooks. And so authors who, good, bad, indifferent, were being able to write their own books and publish them. And then Amazon said, hey, wouldn't it be good if you had the ability to have someone narrate your books? And so then they got a group of people to set up this audio side of the e-books. And so I put myself on a profile. I mean, that was quite big by then because in the States, I don't know if you know, but audiobooks are so enormous, it's unbelievable. But you have to say to yourself, there's a huge amount of people in the States and they travel a lot. So they listen to audiobooks when they're in the car and they go on long journeys. And really Europeans don't do that so much. So audiobooks no. are not sold so much here, but that's how I learned. I made mistakes. I got my technological son, who's a software developer. I used to go to work and say, when you come home, do you think you could tell me what I should use as the best platform and how I'll do this and blah, blah. And he would just tell me how to do it. And then I'd set it up. And then on ACX, they'd actually tell you the decibels, the preamps you should use, the microphones, and microphones as you get on are so important. And you learn that from ACX. You have to do a lot of rubbish books first, I have to say. Almost tell by not even looking at the question and answers that there will be a question about uh, what is the mic you're using? Yeah, <laughs> I have got this amazing mic. It's a Lewitt 400 and 40, 440, and it is really good for a female voice, mm -hmm. but a Lewitt, they were designed by these people who used to work for Neumann, and they went to Austria, and they developed this fantastic square, re it's rectangular microphone. I, I think it's amazing microphone. Great, great, great. Okay, so 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 you started uh, um, um, uh, for all people who wanted to uh, do something with uh, professionally voicing audiobooks. Um, um, what's the business model mostly? Okay, so when you very first start and you're having your own business, you actually work royalty share with authors because those authors are starting out as well so it's a journey together in lots of ways and you get to know authors doing that mm -hmm. after a while 
you realize that you're much better than just doing royalty share. Usually what happens is that people maybe will write to you, get in contact with you because they've heard your books on Audible. So on Audible, that's a platform which is very egalitarian in lots of ways because you'll have brilliant people and you'll have people that are just starting out. Mm -hmm. And you as the listener can hear that. So, okay, you start with that royalty share and then little by little you'll find in Britain, and I think that's the same in the continent because I'm with some German and Danish producers and they write to you and they say would you be interested to be on our roster and then if a book comes up then we'll pay you so then you start being paid and the way you're paid is per finished hour now that is really difficult because when you first start out you could take six hours to have a finished hour so it's in your interest to get so much better that you're actually being able to do that hour in an hour and a half so that you get a good rate. And then as you go on, American publishers get in contact with you and American publishers are the ones to have. You said something quite interesting. Um, You said, okay, making no mistakes. Uh, uh, You have to make, so, so, so yes, of course, when, when a book is 800 pages, (laughs) <laughs> and you have to do a retake every two pages, then you've got a big problem. Yeah. yeah. But, but, <laughs> but, but, but I know myself, I have a bit of ADD. So, so, so um, um, uh, narrating an audiobook and making no mistake, <laughs> that's pretty hard. That will be terrible for you. For me, yes, yes. But, 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 but what tricks do you use to make no mistakes? Right. Personally, me, if I get into the character, then I don't make mistakes so much because if I'm really in the character and then you start having dialogue with another character, it all starts living and it's living in your head. So that all happens. It's like you're doing a production and you don't want it to stop. And actually, if you, I've mostly done theater I couldn't possibly stop in a theater and go, oh, I made a mistake. I must go back. You just have to keep going. And I think that's amazing that you've got that. If you're doing it in a film, of course, you go, hmm, retake. Yeah. And that is a bit difficult. The, thing, the funny thing is that I, when you're saying about the ADD thing, is you've got to let go of some things like breaths. Now, if you're doing a promo, you want it to be pristine, clear, and everything has to be absolutely perfect. Every word, every phrase. That is not like that on audiobooks. Because you've got to be a real person with breath. And breath needs to be in the audiobook. Once... I once worked with with a real famous voice from the net the lens and see she had to just do one sentence it was just the payoff and she did the first one i thought mm, second mm, third mm, fourth fifth five six seven eight mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then she and then somehow finally she had him and it was every sentence she did just that one sentence it was magical it was so beautiful so if I understand you well, those people <laughs> should really do ad-driven stuff, but no audiobooks. No, no, because you would go absolutely mad yeah. if that happened to you. You just, you've got to be telling the story. I think the most important thing about an audiobook is that you tell the story. A child can pick that up. And that's when you read stories to children. If you're going, hmm. I think I'll do a different voice for here because, like, uh, it wasn't really... Oh, shut up. You're not even right. You're not even being the person. They want you to be the character. It doesn't matter if your voice cracks and you do stupid things. They want you to be the character. Great, great. Um, The viewers are already asking uh, lots of questions. Mm -hmm. If you have any questions, just ask them. Uh, 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 We will soon start with uh, doing a round of of questions just 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 i was wondering i was wondering uh, um um sometimes you are reading out loud about a book so so you're doing an 
an audiobook and let's assume there are six really big uh, big uh, characters in the, in the book so so you do your prep and you think, okay, uh, that one is going to uh, talk a bit low, that one is going to talk high or, or whatever. And, and then sometimes you are on pages and you think, oh my God, now, now two voices which are quite the same yeah. are there on the same page within a few seconds. I have to do two voices which are, hmm, bit too much the same i'm going to tell you what the problem is with what you said so you said <clears throat> i've got a voice that is a bit higher a bit lower and then i can differentiate yeah. but that isn't what you do i say i'm going to be a man like this because i have a character like this yeah. i'm a sneaky bastard and i'm always going to be like that it doesn't matter what happens so i can see that man he yeah. is a bastard and he is always going to have that voice because I know him. Yeah. Whereas I'm going to have a man who's not like that. He may sound very similar to him, but he's a truthful, loving, gorgeous man. And he will always be like that. So uh, if I have the image of that person in my mind, mm -hmm. they can talk to each other as much as they want and you will always know that they're different. Very nice, very nice. And and how long does it uh, take for you to to know how how those people will act? That's the author. Now the author sometimes will take a long time to actually describe a character. You might not know how the character is completely until the middle of the book, and yeah. that's why you have to read. <clears throat> so. so Yes, yes. Okay. So, so the thing is, that's what you're doing when you're researching. You don't know everything until the end of the book. Yeah. So you do your research and you, you, you just write and write and write. So, so, so if, the, if the writer is some, somewhere, uh, he or she is uh, writing down, um, uh, uh, he, he was drinking his Fanta really slowly, you think, oh, wait a minute, slowly. So it's a bit more relaxed person or something like that. Exactly. It's like looking at a film script or a, a theatre script. Every tiny detail of that person. And it's strange, but you don't, you don't realize until you're finished, oh, I know everything about that person now. So when you say the first word, all those things are there. And you release it slightly like the author releases it, which is fine. I tell you the worst thing is when you know that that really truthful, beautiful man is the murderer. <laughs> so you have to make him so genuine, so truthful all the time that he is the murderer. And if any time you let it go that he's suspicious, you've ruined the story. Yeah. Oh, great, great, nice. Let's do some questions. Uh, Herik de Walle says, very nice webinar. Nano, what is your uh, advice for men reading books who have to perform as a woman? Or okay, so we've both got the same problem when we're doing different sexes. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, character is all. So you know that female, you may be a man with a very deep voice, but that is really not the problem. The problem is you being the female. So get the female and you will find even when you've got that voice, oh, you, you don't have to go all teeny weeny, but you can have that soft thing because you are being the woman. That's the same with me with men. I used to go, oh, like, um, yeah, I'm a man. That yeah. isn't a man's voice. You have got to be the character is the person, the thing. Get to the character first. You can be a woman. Yeah. Okay, great, great. So uh, Richard, Richards, um, I think he's. It's a bit of the same questions. Uh, a, a question. Um, um, uh, how do you bring the character to life if if it's not your strength? Okay. Now that is a very interesting question because you can dislike certain characters 
you know, you might find it difficult. Historical fiction is interesting because you're going to have a lot of families who go through sagas, you're going to have them go through generations. And you have to be clever with that because, of course, it's you doing all of it, but you need to have families having similar voices. Now, that is hard to do. If they're a family and they come from wherever they come from, it's often good to give them some sort of tick. You know, maybe they will have a little lisp or something like that. So even if you don't like them, if you act or you find it really difficult, mm -hmm. do something with your mouth to make the voice slightly weird or it actually shows generationally. So if, if, if you just put your tongue up there and you always kept it there and that group of people always speak like, spoke like that, you know, Right. So you could have them generationally like that, yeah. Great, great. Uh, Jan Ono Bonstra, that's a Dutch name, uh, said maybe I missed it, but how do you go about quotation a book? Another really interesting thing, and that will mostly be in non-fiction. Now, if you've got it in fiction, it will be somebody looking back or reading something. So they might be thinking about the lover or about the person from the past, an ancient aunt who said something. So you just do a whisper of that voice. Or even if they never come up and they're not a character, make the character. Character is all. So if you're reading it, you go, she said she never would. She never would. So that's like a whisper of a voice so that you know that you're coming out of the narration in nonfiction. When you have that type of quotation, that's very different because you can say Freud said, and you really need to have a pause and you need to go into another character, which is your Freud character. So that, I, I mean, obviously I'm coming, I think all narrators have to do this personally, but you have to do a different type of, paused voice so no. that we know what it is another question of him was uh, um, um, uh, how long are you busy with most books so i heard you say three weeks or or so yeah. so um in the very beginning i used to well not so long ago i thought i'll be so happy if i just do an audio book a month but now I realize that in fact what you can do is do two a month because you can be prepping one mm -hmm. as you're recording in the morning and then you prep it in the afternoon. So I would say that I always say, look, I'll do it in three weeks, but it could be a month and they'll give you a month because they want to make sure that you do it really well. And if you have to go back and do things, mistakes happen. You, sometimes you can get fatigue and you need to say, I have to have a day off. <laughs> Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, okay, Maxwell Peters, uh, uh, he asked something I think it's already answered. answered. Uh, Christel van Eyck, that's funny, Christel uh, started in my radio show. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, Christel says, when you narrate a book for grown-ups and a certain, certain character has an accent, let's say a French one, yes. what do you do to accomplish that? So actually, that is when accents really come into their own in children's books. And children love hearing them. So they can be really emphasized. But of course, you know, I've got a British type voice. And so we hear French a bit different from how a French person would. Same mm -hmm. thing with Dutch. But I just listen to that voice. Listen, listen, listen to a Dutch person. Listen, listen, listen to Swedish. And so then, you know, oh, and the French, you know, I mean, like we are really into that. And then a the French in the children's things, they love it, you know. But it, it's often exaggerated. So, but obviously... I say when somebody's got an accent in an adult book, there is no point in making it emphasized because all it is is a parody and you don't want it to be a parody. So even like we, I know in Holland you have different accents. Mm -hmm. So that's the same in Britain. There is many, many different accents. So if you're going to do a Welsh accent or a Scottish accent or a Northern accent, if you lightly touch it, I think lightly touch it, it just means that that person does come from there and it means that other people are not going to find it hard to understand, but you just change it, you know, so like it happens even when you're North American, just to put that American thing in. Don't overact the cake. No, no, because it sounds like you're parodying the people. 
Yeah, sometimes producers say uh, 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 don't make a character out of a, out of a, of every character. So, so those really small parts you shouldn't do, or 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 how did it, do you see that? No, I think small parts, mm -hmm. just like anything. Think about watching a film or seeing a play. You know, you might have the waitress coming on and she is a particular character. She might only come on for 10 minutes. You'll remember her, but she's not going to upstage anybody. She will just come on and be her person. Yeah. I think you need to be the person. That is important. Always, always. Always, yeah. But, but, yeah. but, 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 but let's say um, 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 it's, it's a scene where uh, somebody is in... in, in a store and it's just the waitress who says uh, thank you very much or something like that what, what what would you think then well you have loads of characters like that you know you go to a spanish island hola senora yeah but it's really important to be the character in the island yeah so if you just went hola senora and you were doing the narrator voice it would jump out to the person you just become where it's like the setting if you know what i mean the italian waiter the receptionist <laughs> Uh, uh, when mentioning um, over egg uh, or don't over egg the, the cake, is there a difference between children books and adult books? Oh. It's a huge difference because children, that's the first type of performance art that they've actually heard when you read a book to them. I mean, very, very small children will be listening to that. And that really stimulates their imagination. You can see them go, oh, you're doing something different. Yeah. And they've got pictures to look at. And really what you do is you actually slowing down what you're doing because you need them to, they're learning language as they're listening to you. And without thinking that is what you're doing. So you're making large characters yeah. and you're slowing them down. And you're narrating in a very exciting way. So they hang on your words. Because this is a first for them. And they really love, I don't know why they love it like that, but I'm sure it's to do with learning language. They are learning things about the subtlety of feeling. Because you're going, what's going to happen? And they're going, oh. And the pause is a little longer. Everything is a bit bigger. It's like a pantomime. Yeah. Everything is bigger. And as they get older, they get smaller and smaller. But even YA, young adults, mm -hmm. they like fantasy, like really grisly, crazy things. And they're big characters. Yeah. Yeah. Adults don't particularly like those type of books. You know what I mean? So it must gradually, it gradually changes as you get older. Do you, do you listen to audiobooks from other persons often? Oh, yes, all the time. It makes me go to sleep. I mean, I don't mean that in a terrible way. But mm -hmm. before I go to bed, rather than read a physical book, I will listen to an audio book because I want to see how people are. Learning, learning, learning is the same in any performance art. Are, and there, are there any voices where you say, people, you have to listen to those audiobook voices. If you want to learn, this was my inspiration. Well... I, I do, but the thing is, they're all British voices. There's, there's another thing that I have learned, that as far as the sound of voice, you stick to your own type of accent, if you know what I mean. So British people like listening to British narrators. Americans like listening to American narrators. In some instances, Americans like listening to the accent where they come from. That's not so much with the British. I also think that's very, very similar in the continent. I know it with Spanish, but they only like to listen to Spanish people. They, it's very hard for it when it's not your language. Yeah. It's very hard. Good. James Williams says, uh, this is a very nice webinar, Nano. Thank you. Uh, I really would like, to, uh, would like my kids to listen to some audio books more. Uh, do you have a YouTube channel? <laughs> of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, I have a YouTube channel, which is actually run for children who um, 
they're all in different countries and they're trying to get them to listen to a lot of English because, you know, I mean, parents always want their children to keep their mother tongue when they're in different countries. So my YouTube channel is called Mimi and Me. And uh, I, we'll put it on the webinar when before I leave so you'll be able to click it. But yeah. I do books there from, I think it's sort of like about three to four or five. We're getting bigger as we go on, but they're picture books so the children can look at the pictures Great. and hear the so voice. Me, me, and me. M E, M E. M I, M I. Me, me. Yeah, okay. Me, me, and, and me. Yeah, me, me, and me. Yeah, okay. Great. Uh, Richard has another question. Um, am I right in thinking, therefore, that certain voices suit certain works? Oh, I think this is about doing audiobooks or not doing e-learnings or advertising. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so you don't do advertising or... Oh, yes. I, I do loads of things for voice booking, actually. But I, I think people choose my voice to be explainers. You know, I, I am a much more explainer. I don't know why, but my voice sounds knowledgeable. I can do nonfiction and that's I can sound like I am the scientist, even though I don't understand it. But so that's what's interesting about voices is that your voice fits certain things. My voice is really good for historical fiction. Yeah. Now, therefore I can do quite a lot of promos because of that, because I'm explaining yeah. e-learning. I think the same thing about character about e-learning because I've done a lot for children and just explaining to them. If you are just explaining like that, it is really boring. So you need to pick someone, even if it's a teacher you loved when you're at school and you say, oh, we're doing this, blah, blah. And we, you're so interested in it because e-learning of any of those long form narration, you need to be interested in every bit of what you're saying. Later on, uh, we will uh, do some questions about the money. That's yes, late. yes, yes. Yeah. Cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's have a look. El Pem says, uh, oh, that's a good one. If you're talking for days and days and days, how do you avoid a dry mouth when reading four and a half hour nonstop? Yep. Well, I mean, as I said, you can actually press the pause button. <laughs> you know, that is really important. And you do. So it, when you're in a studio, the, the people who, you know, because you have a director in a studio, this, they'll always, at 90 minutes, they'll go, 90 minutes, they open all the doors, people walk around and drink water. Yeah. Because you have to be hydrated. It is so essential to be hydrated. Yeah. You can get too much saliva, and that is when you are dehydrated. Because your body is pouring saliva into your mouth to try and hydrate you for some reason but i always have a bottle in the booth and i am hydrated it's better to hydrate yourself before you go to bed are there things you do to start your day to prepare your voice yes i always do warm-ups and yeah. i find it after a lot of years of acting because actors also warm up their voices you cannot use your voice and i mean i'm old and i've got a pretty flexible young voice actually yeah because I have always looked after it and I have always done exercises, warm-ups. It's just the same as an athlete. This is the muscle that you are using all the time, breath and your vocal cords. Are there then also things you don't do in your life because you, you know it's, it's, Bad for you. it's a 40 days a week job for you where you yeah. work for 20 hours or so? Or, or Yeah. So uh, the one big thing that has I never do is I don't eat dairy products because dairy products make too much mucus. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes you can go a bit mad and have cream and cheese. And I can tell that. I can feel this little sort of <clears throat> in my voice. So that does happen. And um, I sing. No, I, I'm not a good singer. I, I've never sung as a performance or maybe, you know, as a musical, but not as a, like Matilda or somebody, but I sing to warm up my voice. So it energizes me. I use my breath and I really actually do lots of it. And plus I do gaming. Yeah. So you could ruin your voice doing gaming. Yeah. Screaming, screaming. And yeah. yeah. And, and in an audio book, can I just say is 
that you have a lot of screaming in historical fiction because they have all these battles. But you can't do, you have to do the same thing. You can't go above certain decibels. You have yeah. to stay there. You have to have the effort, but not the, the volume. There's a great, there's a great YouTube, YouTube click, uh, clip sorry, about a, 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 a Dave Kroll from uh, Foo Fighters in yes. Nirvana, uh, uh, where they uh, let you hear him singing uh, without the music. And the funny thing is, uh, it's a pretty hard rock band. But yeah, yeah. He doesn't scream. That's no. And, and you'll find that musicians know that really well. They are sort of going, I come on to, and they are, they're just showing its effort, but they don't ruin their, ruin their voices. Yeah. Adriana Kellis, she asks, uh, do you give a workshop? Well, you are doing now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do you also do other workshops? <laughs> well, I actually work mostly with children doing storytelling. Oh, and over this period of time, because I can't do it physically, children and I have done Zooms because doing workshops with children about making up stories is really important for their creative writing. Yeah. So I do a lot of that. Yeah. Right. Another question from Adrienne is, should I get an agent to promote me for audiobooks? Well, this is very interesting because there are a very few agents who only deal with audiobooks. Probably more in the States, because in the States, you earn way more money. Mm -hmm. And they like working with union people, you know. So that is a very big difference between Europe and yep. the States. And they earn an amount of money which is sanctioned by the union. And therefore, it's in the agent's interest to work with people in audiobooks, even though it's much less money than doing games or something like that. But personally, I've got an agent and the agent only puts me up for things like games because that's money. They don't put you up for audiobooks. Really, audiobooks are word of mouth and you have to write to publishers yeah. with, with samples. That's another webinar we should do. How to make a perfect sample because people who are casting you only listen to about five seconds. That's a really good one. Yeah. Hmm. Arja Ippenburg, that's a Dutch name. Uh, she says, uh, when doing a biography, uh, do you give the person the tone of voice he or she has? Well, I think it's she then. Yeah. Well, a biography is different from an autobiography. So yeah. you've got a difference there. So a biography is definitely somebody looking at the person. Mm -hmm. So you need to take on the author's persona. But an autobiography is very different, I think, and I've only done one of those, where you look at the character. A again, I always go back to the character, but you give them a lilt. Say they were Welsh, and I'm only looking at myself, but say where they were from the north of the Netherlands or Zetland or something like that, you would give them a touch, just that little touch, because they have a character and the autobiography is written in their dialogue. Okay, who was the person you were doing the autobiography? Biography, yeah. She who? was a circus performer and she came from the East End. So in lots of ways, it was pretty easy for me because she was sort of like, you know, a, a girl. And I could, I just gave her a bit like that because she was a real sort of spunky little creature. And... As she got older, she became more sophisticated. So it was really interesting. Yeah, like, and then she dampened down and she wanted people to think of her as very sensible and everything like that. Really nice. Anna Jos, she asks, uh, what's the maximum number of hours you record on one day? In one day. So in the beginning of a book, I will probably do about two or three hours, which is not long, really but I will have breaks in that. But because that's the beginning of the book and I'm starting it. Yeah. Then when it heats up, you actually get so interested in it. You can do about four or five hours. And then they might be writing to you and saying, when is it, when is it coming? And you think, God, I have to finish it. So there is a bit of uh, heat on you. And so 
sometimes when you're at a deadline, you can do, you could do six or seven, eight hours sometimes. A day. If you have to, and you know that you're not going to do it, you just have to. You work into the night. Remember, if you've got your home studio, you can just creep into the middle of the night. It's better than not sleeping. This was also a question from Machtelt van der Graag. You know Machtelt. Oh, Machtelt. <laughs> um, but, 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 but doing six hours in one day or eight or... or um, um, I think I think um, in many jobs uh, sometimes there is a deadline and you you just have to manage it. Just you do have to have to work work and work till three o'clock <clears throat> uh, in the, the, the in the morning. But being in a rush while doing an audio book, you uh, can't do that. That is why you have to keep being your narrator. You have to be calm. So I'm saying those eight hours, but I'm not doing them just one after the other. I'm going to have two hour chunks. I'm going to go for a drive. I might teach a lesson and then I'll come back. There's absolutely no way. I mean, I have done things where I have done it for that length of time, but the reason why it takes so long is because you have to keep the momentum. You have to be in the character. You can't change it. No. Okay. So, um, I think, uh, we're going to wrap up. Uh, we have to talk about money. Oh yes, something we have to do, and and I think for uh, all people who are watching, who are, are just starting out, or all the adult, uh, no, sorry, all the parents who are thinking, okay, this is really great, but 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 I want some some um, oh, I forgot the English name. Uh, um, uh, well, I will just ask you the question, then you will know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what what are good children's books to read out loud? Okay, well, uh, Julia Donaldson, Julia Donaldson, they're very simple English books mm. and they are really funny because they're about monsters who are funny and cuddly. So, and she does some very sympathetic things about children growing up or losing people. And they're all metaphors because they're creatures. And once you get into picture books, Put in Julia Donaldson, and you, she's done a lot of books, but there'll be people next to her that they'll say, if you like this, you like that. They're the sort of children's books you want. They want to be simple and metaphors because every book for ch children are moral. No, they're all, they all have morals. But you want the ones that are funny, not the ones that are going, if you brush your teeth, you've got to have that rubbish. Yes. So you want to have fun. You want to have characters coming off the page. What do you think of the Harry Potter books? I love Harry Potter. I used to, re I read all those books to my children out loud. They in fact didn't even want to read them by themselves because we just brought them to life. That we, we, in the holidays, we used to lie in bed for hours reading Harry Potter. <laughs> What for me was the horror point. It's that point where your kid is in, um, here in Holland, it's the eighth grade. So, so yeah. when they are um, secondary school, like they're going to the big school. Uh, yeah, yeah. So when they are uh, somewhere between eleven and twelve year old, old yeah. then there's the moment. Okay, st stop reading. Stop. Yeah, preteens. Yes, and the strange thing with both of both of my daughters, it was the same book, and it was Harry Potter number four. <laughs> It's somewhere halfway. It was okay, okay, Dad. That's enough, Dad. But that was when Harry Potter there started to be love interest, and that that was the bit where they went. I don't want you to be talking about her kissing him yeah. and liking him. No, that that really freaks them out. Yeah, maybe, well, maybe yes. <clears throat> um, have you uh, have you read Alone in the World from uh, um, uh, Hector Melo, the the, 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 the French? No, no, it's oh. the French uh, Sans Famille. That's the French. Oh, I'm going to read that. Yeah. Alone in the world. Alone in the world. It's, it sounds so familiar to me, yeah. but I haven't read it. No. It's an epic international story. Um, I think it's written in uh, uh, 90, 1908 or something like that. Mm. Uh, um, for me, that was one of the best best books to read out loud for children ever. And it's strange because it's from 19, 
eight and then you think okay it's written in an old language or so no it's really really great actually the french do that really well I yeah. mean, even, and the t Tintin, Tintin, I yeah. mean, they are so exciting. Children love those books. Yeah. Producers over here are saying it's from 1878. Whoa. So it's Victor Hugo. Yeah. 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 Amazing. Amazing. Okay. Okay. I'm, let's talk about money. Um, yeah. Yeah. So well, I, well, yeah. Sorry. Well, I started out telling you about the royalty share. Yeah. And so the thing is, I'm going to talk to you about what happens in Britain. And it's interesting because I've started working with Danish people who also do audio books in English. Mm -hmm. So the Danish do, they pay about as much as the Americans, which is interesting. So they've obviously thought, oh, we're going to pay you a living wage. Royalty books. Okay, it's going to take you years to get a living wage out of those books, but they'll be on Audible for a long time and you keep getting royalties from it. Unless, I, I do know people who do strange romances. I don't know if you know, but I'm just going to cough. <coughs> Sorry, but I've got a frog in my throat. You. But anyway, um, the Americans, and I suppose there's lots of Americans listening, they know about these Regency romances. Now, they're set in England, but they're actually sort of soft pornography really because they strip off all their clothes all the time but those are very popular in america now if you do those on royalty you earn a huge amount of money because they are turning over all the time so if you go into acx the things to choose are romances you'll make money from doing that so choosing your title when you do royalty you'll make money but if you want to do literary works that's hard. You don't make money from that. So then now you get to a different platform where you've got small publishers. Small yeah. publishers look for narrators because they've realized that when they put out a book, when a book launches, they have to launch the audio book now. So they are looking for audio narrators. In Britain, because our equity, you know, our union is not very strong, we really the most you can get as an ordinary run-of-the-mill narrator is about 100 or 120 pounds per finished hour and that isn't very much money actually when you put so much work into it because it is a labor of love if you are a celebrity because now they've realized there's all these celebrities are going to do it but i have to say with the proviso that some celebrities hate doing it because it's long form and it's so tiring they just hate doing it. So that's good for people like me. It's work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They just hate it. But they get paid thousands yeah. per finished hour. Thousands. Yeah. So, it's, um, um, Do you think with some books, oh, okay, this is a book where I think I have to ask more or, or you think I have to ask less? Yeah, well, I, now I've started working for quite a few American publishers yeah. and um, they say, oh, I'm going to pay you $225 pound, dollars mm -hmm. per finished hour. And I say, no, I want 250 because I'm an equity member and I'm SAG-AFTRA. So they, very easy, they go, sure, fine. Because if they want you and you've got a quality voice, they will give it to you. Yeah. The Americans are really, I, I, I'm sure there's Americans listening to this, but they are much more generous spirited than the British. The Continentals, all right, all right. <laughs> but I mean, I think on Europeans are much more like, mm, are you worth it? You know, they're not really sure because they don't know about sales. In America, it's marketing and they make a lot of money from audiobooks. We don't. In Europe, we don't. So, I think the problem uh, in the Netherlands is that our our, our home market is so so small. Well, yeah. uh, so if you do a Dutch audiobook, uh, 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 yeah, how many people in the world are there who are speaking Dutch? Is I think it's twenty five million or something like that. Yeah. So that's something else. Than doing. Yeah, I I think that's difficult because people would really listen to them. I mean, I think you would have good sales because the one thing I've learned is people like listening to their own language. They really do. So if somebody had a niche 
publishing house that did audiobooks for Holland, I think they would, the authors would love it and they would sell well. Because in Norway, you know, I did Vigdis Horta, who is a really amazing novelist in Norway. Well, nobody in the world has heard of her, but she is so big that people in the world have heard of her because she's groundbreaking. Now, she wouldn't have sold much in Norway, but she sold. I, I did her book and it sold. You know, I mean, people are very interested in listening to translations. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and um, how about retakes? Uh, 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 um, well, pickups Pick or retakes? Yes. Um, what's the difference? Sorry. Okay. So retakes is what the punch and roll thing where you know you've made a mistake as you're narrating and you stop, pause, go back and fill it in and yeah. correct it. That's a retake. But a pickup is where the engineers got it, the proof has got it, and they go, mm, you should have said he should have done this, not he would have done this. And you have That's to. That's what I mean. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then when that happens, you have got to go through the whole book. Yeah. And you have got to do all the pickups absolutely perfectly. A lot of, it's hard. That's hard. Yeah. It's not easy. But 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 uh, um, are there? Um, do you sometimes uh, uh, and, um, charge extra for that or, or? Well, no, because that's the per finished hour. It's a lovely word, isn't it? Per finished hour. <laughs> So the hour is finished when you're finished, not when, <laughs> you know, you think you are. So you've got to do those. You've got to do the pickups. That's a part of it. Yeah. Great. All right. I think we're there. Um, on, such, on such a warm day. Uh, yes. We did it. We did it. We thought we weren't going to be able to stay here, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> But, but but it's such an amazing craft, and uh, I think uh, I think we both are so lucky to to be in in voiceover. And uh, um, uh, um, if I look at how many people are watching right now, uh, 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 there are many people who are watching who are thinking, "I have a great job." It is a great job. I mean, the fact is you are so satisfied after a day's work. That's why sometimes you could go on for a long time because you're satisfied. You yeah, know. Yeah. That's a good one. Uh, before we end, um, we continue next Monday with the 1605 Content Festival. We have two webinars to go and then uh, we've done one month. End of June. Pretty awesome month. Uh, oh, I said... I'm saying awesome. Well, we have Buffy Duberman next Monday. Uh, if you are a non-native, uh, uh, well, well, if you're not native English, let's uh, say it like that, uh, uh, then uh, you should look to Buffy. Why? Buffy is a language coach um, uh, uh, who's not not only teaching you to how to speak English in the right way but if um, if sometimes you have to do something in in the English language and you aren't that sure um, if you are the right person to do that she will give you just the amount of uh, here you have it I'm a non-native English uh, um, how should I say it um, she makes you just strong. Well, that's a bit like when you're doing audiobooks and you just touch the Swedish language or touch the Dutch. <laughs> that's something where she's going to help you with. Next Monday at 16.05 and um, next Tuesday, uh, I will end the 16.05 Content Festival with my webinar, How to Write in Spoken Words. If you are from Holland, uh, uh, um, I already done this one in Dutch and Next Tuesday, it will be in English. And uh, yeah, um, I will uh, do the webinar about how to how to make a, a script, scripts in writing language, how to translate them to speaking language. And many times it's, it's just simple steps, but it's handy to know which steps you should take. Well, okay, Nano, thanks very much. Um, if people have questions for you, how can they reach you? I have a uh, website where you can contact me and ask me questions if you want. And my website is 
nano voice artist nano voice artist dot com or dot co uk nano voice, voice artist. artist you are thank you very much for this webinar i really enjoyed it great bye bye <laughs> bye